Um, our next presenter is Dr. Yamashiro. He had attended undergraduate college at the University of California in San Diego, receiving his bachelor's degree in bioengineering and biology. He obtained his PhD in 1986 and his MD in 1989 from New York University School of Medicine. Dr. Yamashiro received his pediatric residency training at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, completing pediatric residency in 1992 and a fellowship in pediatric hematology oncology in 1995. He was on staff at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia for two years prior to joining the faculty at Columbia University and the New York Presbyterian Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital in 1997. He is currently an associate professor of pediatrics and pediatrics and pathology and cell biology. Dr. Yamashiro's major interest uh, clinically and scientifically are pediatric cancers such as neuroblastoma and Wilms tumor. His focus on the, is on the identification of novel therapeutics for the treatment of neuroblastoma. He has funding from the Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation and Hyundai Hope on Wheels. Dr. Yamashiro is also the chair of the Medical Advisory Board of CNCF. Dr. Yamashiro. Thank you, Pat. It's actually, it's always a wonderful experience to, to come to this event, to see all the families, to see the children, especially to see the children sort of all running around and, and, and many of them doing quite well. So today I'm going to talk about something that uh, Giselle Scholler touched on a little bit um, yesterday, uh, but this is going to be the very sort of simplistic view. And so to try and uh, get people up to date as far as sort of personalized medicine uh, for neuroblastoma. And so this is a picture of Steve Jobs, um, who really left a legacy as far as personalized medicine. He was actually one of the first persons to actually have his, his tumor tested, and he had pancreatic cancer. And at the time, sort of before his death in 2011, he spent over $100,000, and he had actually talked to people at the Broad Institute and uh, the people eventually there who founded Foundation One Medicine to have his, his tumor sequenced. And, Unfortunately, he actually did not survive his pancreatic cancer. But from there, we've had actually a plethora of different tests. And part of it is, is at the time, he spent over $100,000. And being Steve Jobs, that, uh, that's a drop in the, in the, in the bucket for, for, for him. But what's happened over the past five, 10 years is the cost of sequencing, of sequencing someone's DNA has come down dramatically. And that's really been made it accessible to, to all patients. And so there's increasing availability of sort of what we call clinical grade tests, meaning CLIA. So there is something you have to get certified. You just can't just go to your backyard and run this test and, 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 and do this. So many different centers, Dana Farber, the Mass General, ours at Columbia University, have this test available. There are also different companies that are actually doing this as well. The, probably the, the most well-known ones are Champions, uh, N of One, and then also Foundation One Medicine. So I'm going to talk about sort of how, how can you get your tumor tested, and what does tumor testing do? Um, as this is sort of what can we detect by this thing called next generation sequencing. And so the theory is, or how it actually happens is, is then here's a piece of a chromosome, and what happens is, is you take someone's DNA and you actually fragment it into very these really small little pieces. And you figure out a way actually how to sequence in what's called massive parallel sequencing. You can sequence these little pieces of, of DNA and then you can see and detect it. And then you sort of need lots of computing power and you sort of put it all together. And then you can figure out, well, if this is chromosome one and this is an A, and then, but when we sequence, these little fragments, they're relatively small, is there a change that occurs? So this is a point mutation that now I talked about before to C. You can see, are you missing pieces as well? So you can sort of, if you don't detect any sort of these little pieces, did you have a deletion? If you have half them out, do you just have deleted in one chromosome but not in both chromosomes? You can also detect, are there gains that occur? You can also sometimes figure out as well, are there what's called translocation? So if you have a fusion between or joining together of one chromosome, say chromosome one, gets made it to chromosome five. Uh, and in other things as well, you can also detect if there, there's pathogens as well. You can detect that there's sort of non-human sequences. 
So, Foundation One is part, was one of the first companies to actually develop this test as far as on a commercial basis. And so, what they've done is they look at actually at a panel of genes. And so, they've looked at, looked at about 255 cancer related genes and other uh, sort of academic institutions as well. We've done this as well. We actually have a similar sort of panel of about 467 genes. And these are genes that we know are actually related to cancer. So we're not looking at everything here. We're just looking at cancer-related genes. And so you can test, are there mutations in ALK? Are there mutations in these other genes as well uh, that we know are associated with cancer? So what do we need to act, so, so what's the, you may have heard this term before, so what's the workflow, what happens? So how do you get your tumor tested? So every child you have, this is actually a piece of tumor here that's on a glass slide, you can see those little pieces. And then here's actually how do when we, when the pathologist gets a tumor, they put it actually in wax actually. They fix it, make sure that it doesn't de de degrade, and then they put it in sort of this wax, and then they can slice it up into these little slides. You can then extract the DNA, and then there's a machine that's called sequencers, uh, and then you can then figure out are there point mutations, are there insertions, deletions, are these copy number alterations or rearrangements, and then we'll get to this interpretation and analysis, and then you finally get a clinical report. So, first off, what do you need? So, you need, uh, if there's either foundation one and we as well, you actually need what's called a paraffin block. So I, as I told you, that you have this tumor that can be in this, in the, within this wax or paraffin, or you can slice up slides. Now part of what you need to do though is you need to actually have the pathologist look at it because if your child has had their tumor taken out, oftentimes it's all degraded, it's dead, it's necrotic. So we actually need to have a certain amount of tumor that's there. Or if you take a tumor out, sometimes there's tumor, but maybe there's a lot of kidney. There's a lot of normal tissue that's there. So you need a pathologist to be able to look at and say, okay, this is adequate for us to, to, to look at. Because if you have a very small amount of tumor that's there, and then you can be sequencing normal tumor, which is not what you want to be doing. Or one of the other options is, is sometimes, and we, it's part of our routine now at our institution, is you actually, when you get the pathologist gets tumors, we take little pieces out and we actually then freeze them down. And so these are in the, what's called little cryo tubes and, and, and you can freeze those down. And that sort of preserves the tumor. And for us to be able to look at both the DNA, and later I'll talk about it, you, need to, you can look at RNA as well. So again, so this is the sequencing workflow. You extract the DNA from, from, from those, you do the sequencing, and then you get sort of these very Actually, you don't get these reports. Actually, we get these reports as far as are there point mutations, assertions, and deletions. The simplified version, though, is, is, is that you can, and this is a report that Foundation One will, will, will put out. They'll say, okay, what genes are altered? So they'll say on their list, the EGF receptor with the epidermal growth factor receptor has this mutation that occurs. And then we know, say, like for breast cancer, maybe that there are approved therapies such as a lot of jafitinib. Um, there may be approved therapies, which I'll we'll talk about. Let's see here. Let's see. So we know there are FDA has approved certain drugs specifically for a particular tumor. But then we also know that that there's a target therapy for another type. So you may have breast cancer, but there may be a drug that's approved for colon cancer. So because the FDA has approved it, you may in fact be able to use that. And the third report that you also get is to say, are there clinical trials available for this particular drug? So I'll give you an example sort of, the, of the first. So vimorafenib was approved for therapy for melanoma. So in melanoma, probably about 30, 40% of the patients have a mutation in what's called BRAF. And so here's the wild type. So there's a receptor, there's this protein called BRAF, and then it acts and activates this protein called MEK. But in the case of melanoma, there's a mutation called a V600 mutation in which it actually overly stimulates MEK. And by that means, you get increased proliferation and you actually suppress what's called apoptosis, which is actually how a mechanism by which the cells uh, are programmed to die. So this is sort of one of the, the, 
This is a PET scan of a patient with melanoma who has all these bright areas here, all lit up with the melanoma, and then they got treated with the vimerafenib, and actually had, the patient had sort of a remarkable oral spots. So, so this is one in which vimerafenib is actually approved specifically for melanoma, for those patients who have a BRAF V600 mutation. So, how many drugs out there are, are what's, what's called target therapy or approved? So, for adult cancers, which is all in the blue, there's a wide variety of different drugs for different conditions, breast cancer, brain cancers, colorectal cancers, et cetera, a lot for, for lymphoma, a fair amount for leukemia, that are approved for those indications. But the problem is, is for pediatrics, there are probably actually only two drugs that are, that are actually approved for a pediatric indication. One is Everlimus or Affinitor, which is approved for a condition called SEGAS, or subathenable giant cell astrocytomas, in patients with tuberous sclerosis. And then there are patients who, uh, uh, with leukemia who have specific translocation who have the one medicine called Gleevec or Imatinib is approved. So there's great, there's a lot, wide variety of different drugs, but there are very few that are approved for PDIs. Hopefully, as far as targeted therapies, if we talk about antibodies, uh, hopefully relatively soon, we'll actually have the CH1418 antibody, and we can add that to the list as far as targeted therapies that are approved specifically for pediatric cancer. So, but as, as I mentioned, there's the second way you can try and do this. Is there a drug that's approved for some other indications? So, prosopnib, which you've heard again a lot about, is approved therapy for out-translocated non-small cell lung cancer. And it can be used for patients with neuroblastoma who have the ALK mutation. And so one of the problems, though, is, is, is if you're using a drug that's approved for an adult indication is, how do you figure out what dose to use? I mean, I think that's one of the things that we struggle with. If you have a two-year-old, A, you may not be able to swallow the pills, but B, what's the correct dose for a child versus an adult? So for some of these drugs, we actually have have done phase one testing, and we figure out what's the pediatric tolerated dose. And so for drugs like imatinib or there are other, these other different drugs, we actually sort of know what the dose range is for those particular patients, for, for pediatric patients. So we can actually calculate based on how big they are. But we don't have that for all of the drugs, so that's something that potentially you have to extrapolate. And I'll put out this as well. This is not a complete list. Talk to your pediatric oncologist if they're gonna be used on these, these drugs or other drugs as well. The other thing which Dr. Reynolds pointed out as well, you can, have, you can have horse pills and how do you get them into children? This often is not a suspension that you can actually give to, to, to children. For chrysotinum, there actually is a formulation, there's actually a liquid formulation, although you actually can't clinically get, or you can't commercially get that. For chrysotinum, you can get the, 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 the capsules but one thing we don't know is, is actually, how do you give it to the kids? You crush it, you cut it, how well is it absorbed? We don't actually know that for many, many of these different agents. And so that's one of the obstacles we have to overcome for children, who actually, if we try and give them drugs that are proof for, for adults. The other obstacles that we get, which you may run into as well, is that these drugs are pretty expensive. Uh, so if you, want, if you want two pills per day of chrysotinib, it's actually probably about $10,000. That's for, for, for the adults. And so the problem is, is, is that getting the insurance companies to approve these drugs for your patients. Dr. Schulzer mentioned that yesterday as well. Oftentimes you can do, but it's a negotiation. We have to hassle them. We have to call them up. We have to, to keep on talking to people to see can we get this drug approved and to get it to, to the patients. I'll give you an example of one patient I'm taking care of now who I'm trying to give one drug called ruxolitinib for a different type of cancer. And there's an approved do uh, uh, dose for adults. And so in the phase one clinical trial for, for, for pediatrics, the dose is about four times as high. And for treating her particular type of cancer, I really want to give her the much higher dose. But initially, the drug company said, well, we'll give you one pill per day. And we said, no, that's not good enough. My back says we wanted to get like four pills twice a day. And they said no. And so ultimately we had to settle for less amount because otherwise we couldn't get it. 
And so that's what, we're, that's what we sometimes have to struggle with to try and figure out to get the correct dosing for, 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 for children. Okay. The other way you can, you can get your, your, your child use medication, so not all these drugs are actually FDA approved, so you can't just necessarily walk into the drugstore and get it. So crizotinib you can get off, sort of off the shelf. Um, but there are other drugs, there, and these are the COG phase one trials where we're trying to figure out what safe, is the safe dose. And so this is crizotinib, the ADVL1211 is cablizatinib, which also inhibits the MET and VEGFR receptors. But the other, I think, one part about the clinical trials now is, is that we often find that, as Dr. Shaw pointed out, with the crizotinib, they don't always work well as just a single agent. You see some indications that there's some activity, but in fact, you need to actually give it with chemotherapy or other agents. As Dr. Rounds pointed out, fentanyl sometimes doesn't work, works okay, but then you start to you need to give it to other, with other agents like ABT751 or vincristine. So the EDVL1212 is crizotinib in combination with conventional chemotherapy, topotica and cyclophosphamide, or vincristine doxorubicin. There are drugs which are not approved yet, and so the only, and um, there's no way to get these particular drugs unless they're in, they're, your child's enrolled on, on a clinical trial. So there's a, what's called a WE1 inhibitor, uh, which is involved in sort of cell cycle, which uh, is combined with an t can and those, there's also something called a PARP inhibitor as well. So if we identify some of these pathways, yes, we can try and get these patients on to these particular sort of trials and say, okay, how do we, we oh, there's all these different drugs, how, can, how do we best pick the best one for your child? So, well, if there's a, a mutation or in, a change in what's called cell cycle, do we use a cell cycle inhibitor and enroll them on a trial of the drug called LEE0111? So those are some of the ways to actually more rationally pick which particular trial your child might be on. So as I mentioned, so there is foundation one, and we have this panel of looking probably sort of a couple hundred genes. But that's, not the, that, that's sort of not the whole genome. Um, and so this, what this says is this is the genomics core facility, and your DNA comes in, and they ask, like, how do you want to be sequenced? So there are many different ways we can do this. We can do deep hole genome, low pass, deep hole exome, genome-wide exome array, et cetera. So different ways. So what's the way that to, to actually try and look at more of, 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 of a person's DNA? So there, one way you can do it is what's called whole exome sequencing. And so the exome is the part that sort of gives the, the code to make the proteins. There, I think there are about 180,000 exons which come together to, about, to produce about 22,000 genes. And so, and comprise about sort of 3% of the patient's entire DNA. And so we can actually look at what's called the exome, and we can see are there mutations in other genes, not just that limited set of a couple hundred genes. Can we look to see are there mutations in other genes which may be associated with cancer? The other thing as well is, is that with this whole exome sequencing, we actually want to get uh, some of the, some normal DNA from, from the patient, which is, can be blood, um, and that's usually the easiest for the patients with neuroblastoma. Sometimes other patients, we need to go what's called a buckle swap to get normal DNA. Um, but we can also detect what's called germline, meaning those things that are inherited by the patient that are present in the normal tissues as well. We can actually look at what's, are, what are the germline mutations. And we can sometimes say, okay, maybe there's an ALK mutation, maybe we see it just within the tumor, or we can see it actually, it's, it's actually something that might be inherited. We can also look at what's called copy number variation as well. So we can classify them into different categories. Category one, sort of known cancer mutations, a P10 mutation, uh, other mutations which are, we know can cause cancer. There may be mutations in genes or variations in genes. Some of those are just variations that may actually affect therapy. So from the pharmacogenomic standpoint, there are, there, are, there are differences. We have, say, how we metabolize genes. Say there's a particular gene that, that's involved as far as the metabolism for amino TCAN. We can look at that as well and say, okay, this patient may be much more prone to developing neutropenia if they get amino TCAN because they metabolize it less well. There are genes that we are associated, but we don't know for sure. They really appear to be involved with cancer, but we don't know for sure. And then there are mutations in genes which 
and this ACMG is the American Academy of Medical Genetics, uh, in other genes, not really as cancer associated. I'll come back to that in a second. The second part we can look at is what's called the transcriptome. This is actually looking at the RNA, and we can look for mutations that we can confirm that. It's also a nice way to look, are there fusions between two particular serve proteins? And as Dr. Scholler, I think, talked about a little bit yesterday as well, you can see if some of these are, there's DNA to RNA, and if there's an overexpression of, the, of, of these particular genes that might be associated with cancer as well. So this probably provides a little bit more comprehensive view as far as sort of the cancer genetics. Oops. So, you don't get these reports, we get these reports, but we sort of go through them and say, okay, there's maybe an NRAS mutation, there may be a mutation in a gene which we don't quite know about, and here's an example of looking at these sort of chromosomal alterations that occur. So in this particular instance, so the red is sort of loss, you can see that there's loss at 1P, there's loss of distal 1Q, there is 11Q deletion, there's a 17K. So this patient unfortunately has multiple different aberrations that we know are actually associated with sort of poor prognosis in, in neuroblastoma. So if you start looking at all these other genes, one thing you may see is two things. You, you may see variants of unknown, this thing called variants of un, unknown significance, or VUS. So what's VUS mean? So for some, this is sort of that you have this variance. So we all have differences in our genes just because we're just different people. And we don't know whether this gene actually, does it make, is it involved with cancer? So we suspect it to be more sort of pathogenic. Or is it more benign? And it can be happen in two levels. It can happen what we call somatically. We can look at someone's tumor and we can say, hmm, there's this change in this particular gene X, Y, Z. Now, is it involved with cancer? Do we think it's involved or not? And sometimes we have to sort of guess, or actually we go through the literature and say, has it been described before? Do we think it might be involved in cancer? Uh, and so we might say it's a variance, eh, probably doesn't really involve, we really don't know what the answer is. The second thing is, is, is that we can look at the, what's called the constitutional level, meaning that we can see changes or differences in a gene, and it may be in a gene that's a normal gene that you have, and is it, does it make you predisposed to something? We don't always know that particular answer. And so, I mentioned a little bit about this. So when you start doing these clinical exomes or genome sequence, you actually get a lot more information back. And it has implications not only for the patient, but for the family members as well, for the child, for the parents as well. And so there, if there's something that the child inherits, and some people ask this is, does my daughter have that? Or there may be like a BRCA mutation that you might see, which may or may not be involved so much with the patient's neuroblastoma, but maybe has implications for the mother who may be then at risk for developing breast cancer. So there are certain, rec certain genes that, we, that, that the ACGME actually says, okay, we should return these information. There are probably 20 diseases and 60 genes, okay. This is a, a fluid situation because as I mentioned, we, this hasn't been available for all that long. So there are people who say, okay, you have the genetic libertarians so we need to return everything to you. We have on the, sort of the pragmatist or the empiricist that says, well, we'll only return data to, 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 to that are what we think is significant and, not, and we'll limit that amount. It's one of, if you go and try and have this testing, one of the questions that people are going, that your oncologist is going to ask is, do you want everything? Do you want just a limited amount, which is probably this instance? Um, if you're dealing with your child who has neuroblastoma, they're getting treated, do you care so much about this? You're really focused on this aspect of how it relates to their cancer, but do you want to know all the other information? And there are families who say, we want to know everything, and there are families who say, we don't want to know anything. And often that's times the parents have to make a choice as far as what they want. There are, for the ACGME, there are also there are incidental secondary findings, and this is sort of non-cancer ones, um, that, that you may want to get, that 
we should say should give back. So it may actually no impact as far as the patient's treatment. Um, there are things that these, a lot of these are actually involved with the heart, Marfan syndromes, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, sort of big heart. Um, there's familial hypercholesterolemia. There are things like long QT syndrome. So some of the medications we give, Zofran's and instance, may give you a prolonged QT, and meaning that you're, what that means is, is that this is sort of an EKG in which you have, there's sort of the beat of the atrium, then we see the contractions, then we see these other signals. If it gets prolonged, it means that you're, there's going to be delays as far as the, 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 um, the heartbeat essentially. And that can be, if it's very, very prolonged, it can be actually detrimental to, to the patient. So these are some of the things we can actually find on these sort of incidental secondary things as well. So what's the cost? Okay. The list price, these are all list priced, is about $5,800. Our Columbia combined panel is about $5,700. If we do our cancer cervical exome, it's about $8,200. So that's the list price. So as you probably are all aware, you get there's sort of the list price that the insurance companies get billed, and then there's the, the cost that actually gets really reimbursed or actually gets paid by the insurance company. Um, and so that's what's billed. So it may not be that actually that's the cost you will, you'll get back, but um, this is sort of what, what's the list price now. And I think all the companies are roughly about the same at this point. So, um, and the, the caveats are there is often the foundation one and us as well is to say, okay, if you can't afford it, then there are ways sometimes to actually sort of uh, avoid those sort of charges if you would. Okay. So, that's sort of about my brief sort of introduction to, to, to personalized medicine, really from more of the ground up. Um, but I think one of the things that, particularly with the, the, the whole exome sequencing and the transcription, I think it really takes a, a, a group of people, and people have alluded to what's called a, a molecular tumor board. And so what it really takes is sort of pediatric oncologists. This is Andrew Kung, Julie Gray Bender, who's really our leading our, our effort, and which was, we've turned it sort of PIPSI, called Precision in Pediatric Cancer Sequencing Program. Um, but it also takes knowledge as far as the new drugs, the development of therapeutics a aspects. So Julia heads that up along with some other people as well. You have your geneticists. You need your pediatric surgeons. We have various different pediatric surgeons to actually can you get adequate tissue and to get that. The PGM or PGM prone or personalized genomic medicine, uh, the pathologists there really do a lot of the work trying to figure out what we think is a real mutation and what's not. And then you also have the lab researchers. I'm sort of in, actually most of us are in, different, in many of these different camps, but as far as to try and make sense of some of these mutations that we may in fact have. So with that, I thank you, and I'll take any questions that you might have. Go ahead. Apparently I have a lot to say today. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you again. Sure. Um, when you're doing the genome, um, is that a way, your secondary findings, is that a way to tell whether or not the child could also be predisposed to these secondary cancers? You know, we're talking about radiation and follow-on and how many scans, and some kids get secondary cancers and some do not. I mean, is it, could that potentially show whether or not that's a concern of yours or whether or not it's not? Um, it, it potentially could. We don't know necessarily all the predisposing factors that actually lead you to actually get these secondary cancers. Um, if you have a BRCA mutation related to actually for, that's related to say breast cancer, those are things that you actually sh sh should know. If you have defects in the protein called ATM, you may be more disposed to, to breaks or damages to the DNA. So yes, you can actually get that through, through, through the hexome, whole exome sort of sequencing. You can get that sort of separately by the geneticists at this point in time to say, okay, we want a, just a constitutional, meaning that we're just gonna give normal blood, we may want it for mom, we may want it for dad as well, just for them to do that if we think there's some sort of genetic syndrome. Um, but you can get much of that information from, from when we do our testing as, as well. Thanks. Anyone else have any questions? No? Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Yamashiro. Oh my God. We are exactly on time. Uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break. We've got some refreshments and fruit and stuff in the back. So we'll be back here at uh, 11 o'clock.